Greetings, everyone. In research methodology, you are dealing with the data, and you're dealing with the, the um, data that is collected by um, others or data that you have to collect. The goal of uh, research methods is to use empirical techniques uh, to discover the trends and, and characteristics of uh, these uh, subjects that you are studying. Now, if you are lucky, you may get access to data that already exists. For instance, if you are studying some uh, um, behavioral studies or some demographic studies, and you may be able to get data from the local uh, census organization, because census are collected, uh, census are conducted every 10 years or every five years in most countries, and the data are released uh, for research and other uh, purposes. And you may be uh, fortunate to have access to such data. But in cases where you do not have access to such data, and in cases where you have to conduct your own surveys, then you need to do um, a little bit of thinking about how would you collect data, uh, how would you identify a sample, how would you determine the, um, the size of the sample, uh, how surveys are conducted, um, how um, con survey respondents are co um, contacted and listed, and uh, how surveys are executed. And once surveys have been executed, how data is captured, recorded, and is uh, archived in a database format. So today's lecture on sampling and surveys will be discussing all this. Now, if I were to remind you that in, a, in an earlier lecture, and I think in our first and second lectures, um, we talked about a survey of solid waste management. And uh, we showed how um, a student uh, conducted those surveys and um, solicited information from about 120 households and asked them um, uh, questions and collected data about solid waste. So the process of uh, designing a survey questionnaire, the process of uh, the, um, determining the survey size, sample size are all the concerns that we'll be discussing today. And um, in, in this lecture, the examples I will use are from the transportation uh, surveys. Um, I have been working with travel demand and travel behavior data for a very long time in Canada. And I'm, I'm using those uh, surveys as an example to show you how, uh, what are the best practices in uh, survey conduction, conducting surveys, and, and uh, creating data. So uh, the outline for today's lecture is as follows. We will begin with the discussion on data collection. And as I mentioned, uh, we'll be uh, looking at travel behavior data as an example. And then if within travel behavior, uh, one of the key surveys that is conducted is called the OD survey, which is the origin destination survey. And it's a survey of travel behavior as well as uh, a survey of uh, demographics. Um, people are quizzed about their um, um, household structure, age, income, number of people living in the household. And then the questions about their travel behavior, that uh, how often they travel, where they travel to, and where they travel from, what modes of travel, transportation they use, what time of the day, day of the week, um, and what routes they take, and how long it takes them to complete their journeys. Um, all this information is, is collected in the origin destination survey. Uh, we will discuss um, uh, what kind of survey instruments are available. Um, um, namely, can you conduct a telephone interview? That is, that you, once you have enlisted your respondents, can, um, can you conduct a survey by calling them and collecting information over the phone? Um, and in the process, you can actually um, record information by hand. Or, or the, tech, the new way of doing it is called CADI, that is computer assisted telephone interviews where the information is being archived as and is collected on, on a computer even though the, the survey respondent is responding over the phone. But there's always this mail-in interview that you send the uh, survey forms, mail them to the respondents, they fill them up and, and mail those uh, survey instruments back to you. And there are others that we will discuss later. The other question is of sampling methods and size. Um, the random sample uh, is the most uh, preferred option, but sometimes it is not prudent and it's not possible. And sometimes it's not feasible to use a random sample. And then um, other techniques come in handy, such as the clustering samples and stratified samples. And we will discuss how you, what type of uh, technique is suitable under what circumstances. Once we have determined the, the type of uh, uh, survey, um, sampling technique we'll use. The other question comes into mind is to how many people should we survey? And that is the, the number of respondents that are required for, uh, for a survey. And that is called the sampling size. 
uh, or the service, uh, how many samples should we contact. And the size cons considerations are um, dependent upon the margin of error that you would like to work with um, and, and some other considerations, and we'll discuss that in detail today. And after that, I will show you um, the data dictionaries from um, Montreal and Toronto, but more so a, a data dictionary from uh, a survey of, uh, that I conducted, um, and then uh, show you how we have archived that information. Uh, in the database. So this pretty much is the outline for our lecture today. Moving forward, um, the the role of surveys will be discussed first and then um, after that I will move into survey design issues and then the types of surveys and then uh, the emerging survey methods. So why do we conduct surveys? That is the first thing. Now in terms of transportation, uh, we would like to determine travel patterns and personal characteristics. For instance, do uh, people of certain uh, income uh, category belonging to high or low income travel in a particular fashion? For instance, is it true that high income uh, households and high income individuals travel by car and um, low income individuals either travel by public transit or by, by walk or bike? So in order to make those assertions, in order to determine those trends, one need to collect a lot of information. In terms of uh, um, market research, one is always uh, uh, looking into what kind of people would prefer what type of telephone services. Now, in, in developing countries, the, the Internet and the um, uh, wireless telephone has really blossomed. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of competition. There's tremendous amount of diversity and uh, alternatives available. Um, literally hundreds of companies are competing for your, uh, for your uh, business. Now, it is interesting um, to see how they compete against each other. And the way to compete against each other is to determine consumer preferences. And uh, therefore, market surveys are done to determine what kind of consumers would prefer what kind of wireless service. And therefore, the, the marginal difference between two uh, competing uh, wireless service providers is determined by what they perceive as the uh, preference market or, or service preference of the consumers in the same market. And then also um, by conducting surveys, one becomes aware of uh, potential markets. One, is, one may not be aware of the services being used by a manufacturer. Let's say if a manufacturer is producing a product and uh, the manufacturer thinks that the product is used in one province or in one city or by one type of consumers, but would be surprised to see by conducting a survey that in fact the product has been used by someone else in a different market, in a different context, and a different set of consumers. Often. Um, in, in, the, in North America, when new bands are launched, and these are the synthetic bands where uh, a lot of market research is done before a band is put together and, uh, and it's launched, um, uh, suddenly they realize that the, if the band was launched for teenagers, uh, suddenly they realize that, in fact, the band has a bigger appeal in the preteen market. So all this th is known and learned through potential uh, by conducting surveys. But the last, very last example that I shared with you also show you that even though you, uh, even though a band is structured to appeal to a certain cohort, um, it turns out that a different cohort was in fact the right or the more suited market. So service would deliver some insight, but it's not a uh, sure thing to go with. Now, uh, the other aspect of conducting service is the political service. Uh, there are uh, various agencies such as Gallup and others who conduct uh, the, the voter uh, preference surveys before and after the, the elections, and especially before the elections. And these are the opinion surveys, and they are conducted regularly. In the United States, the example is that of the presidential elections. And the surveys are conducted um, years in, ahead, in advance of the, the presidential elections, where uh, the, the pollsters are trying to determine what percentage of the market will vote for one candidate, one presidential candidate, rather than the other. And those surveys continue to the very eve of the elections, and the last elections, uh, the last set of polls taken before the real elections are, the, are called the exit surveys. And they're uh, most of the time fairly accurate in predicting the outcome of the elections. And even though in the United States or in other countries where hundreds of uh, millions of voters are eligible to vote and uh, millions do cast their votes, the surveys by polling agencies are not uh, based on a sample of a few million. In fact, they're not even based on a, a sample of a few hundred thousand. Only a few thousand in individuals are 
uh, uh, systematically selected from the entire population and a sample is drawn from that uh, that, uh, that carefully drawn sample is uh, questioned about their uh, electoral or voter preferences and from that uh, the market share or the future electoral outcomes uh, are determined. So the question is how can one ask a, a question to a few thousand and then from the information collected from those few thousand draw inferences about the preferences of a population that may be of, uh, consisted of millions of people. So um, anyhow, these are the few examples of uh, surveys that are done, namely in, in consumer behavior, in, in, uh, um, in politics, and also in travel behavior. Now if I were to take you back to uh, travel behavior, uh, the entire uh, analysis that follows um, um, on which most transportation and travel um, and tra transport infrastructure investments are made is a process called travel demand modeling and the travel demand modeling relies wholly on this data collected about consumers and their travel behavior so once the data are collected from surveys they are brought into these these uh, they are converted into databases and those databases become the foundation of uh, um, extensive research extensive data mining extensive modeling from which decisions and inferences are decisions are made uh, decisions are made based on the inferences drawn from the models and then billions of dollars of infrastructure investments are made from those. So um, it is uh, an extremely critical uh, element of decision making that is the service and the data that results from these service. And um, also once uh, you have some services in the market, uh, for example telephone services or uh, um, uh, public transit services, surveys are conducted of uh, people's or consumers or compu commuters attitudes uh, um, and ask them and they are quizzed about how their experience has been using a certain service for example traveling from one city to another using a particular type of a transit system or um, if, the, if the government is interested in determining if they have established new uh, service uh, kiosk uh, e-kiosk uh, they can ask questions uh, conduct service of the consumers and ask them what their experiences have been and to try to determine their level of satisfaction with the service and that all is done through service. Now survey design is a very difficult and challenging task and in fact there's a, there's a, a famous saying that if there's garbage in garbage out that is if you feed garbage to your analytical methods and algorithms it will only produce garbage as, a, as an outcome. So what, requ what is required for survey design is the painstaking attention to detail. Every aspect of the survey has to be reviewed and re-reviewed and re-reviewed because the errors made during the design process would seriously undermine your ability to do quality research. Now the survey has to, you have to have a coherent, consistent and systematic work plan. The surveys, large surveys are planned years in advance and um, the execution uh, is thought through months in advance and all the planning takes place um, much much ahead of the execution. Um, the, the surveyors have to have a clear understanding of the market being surveyed. Now I just uh, was told by a student uh, that they were conducting surveys and they realized that uh, the market they were surveying uh, there was more than one language being spoken and the survey questionnaire was only in one language and they found it difficult to get uh, information from their respondents because they would not like to answer in the language in which the survey was designed and therefore one wonders why that was not considered in, in advance if you have multiple languages being spoken in your market then you have to make sure uh, that the survey instrument is such that the that is understandable to the people that you are uh, administering your service and then there has to be a continuous evaluation of the cost effectiveness of the process and there are a few slides that I will share with you from uh, our experience in Toronto and in Montreal in Canada about the the travel demand service and I'll share with you how much it costs to conduct those surveys and you'll realize that sometimes it costs millions of dollars to conduct these surveys and therefore the cost effectiveness is very important it's a very significant consideration in conducting large surveys and then you have to have effective management procedures now one of the key challenges that I face while working in developing countries is to ask about the, the is, ab is about the missing data um, I know and I go after surveys that were conducted in the past 
and um, and reports were written from those surveys and then when I request the database uh, it turns out that no one knows where the data are no one even knows how the data were archived and uh, sometimes no one knows uh, if the data was ever recorded or left uh, in the archives and all these processes um, could be all these outcomes could be avoided if you have an effective management procedure where you know that this once the survey is complete once the databases are are, uh, are designed and and populated how will the information be archived and backed up and what are the mechanisms to ensure that the data once it's in digital format would be would be kept safe uh, for not just one or two months but for decades so that researchers can go back and revisit the data sets uh, if need be and then there has to be some rigorous adherence to the design process once you have defined a design then you have to stick to that and you have to improve it as you proceed so what is the survey design process well uh, let let us go through this and if you were to focus on this slide here you would notice that the first thing to do is define the survey objectives what is the purpose of this survey why are you or, or why is this survey being conducted uh, what are the objectives what decisions or what hypotheses that you would test or would you like to test through this survey that has to be known in advance that objective has to be explicit why the information is being collected what questions would be asked from the database what are the underlying hypotheses how would you test those hypotheses all this information all this has to be clear in your mind and all these objectives have to be explicitly stated once this is done then you have to define the population to be surveyed right what is the population because you will be sampling from a population let's say we are interested in determining the satisfaction level with the education at the undergraduate level in a large university that has both a graduate and undergraduate programs now if you are interested in determining the satisfaction level of students in the undergraduate program then our population comes is our population is defined by the entire undergraduate student body of that university right? that is the population from which a survey a survey sample would be drawn if we are conducting a census for our country then the entire population of that country would be the population for that survey if you're conducting a survey of a firm um, about satisfaction with job then all employees in that firm would be would constitute the population then we have to de determine about the uh, the data requirements what type of data are required uh, in how much detail such information is required for example if we are asking about travel behavior do we need to collect information about a person's gender age income level um, automobile availability ownership of motorcycles or bicycles and then do we also need to know where they live and where they work and how often, often they travel to work and do we also know need to know if they travel from uh, home straight to work or if there is an intermediate stop between home and work all these considerations have to be decided in advance because you need to draw a line that I would ask questions and I need to have this much data available to me if you do not need to know the income for a respondent then don't ask that question uh, every question has to be absolutely necessary to be asked or else if it's if it's uh, it can be avoided then you should the survey first principle of survey is to have it as brief and as quick as possible because the longer the survey the more likely it would be that you would lose a respondent who would even not either not commit to 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 respond to your survey or if they do they would leave the survey somewhere in the middle now you have to define the precision uh, level that is the margin of error you would notice that often when survey results are reported by especially in, in electoral polls uh, the answers are reported as well this result is 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 uh, um, uh, is uh, valid within uh, plus and minus three percent that is the precision level that one takes and I will discuss this in in a little uh, in detail later when we are trying to calculate the sample sizes the decision about the survey instrument is is the next question would it be a mail-in survey would it be a face-to-face -face survey would it be a telephone survey would it be a caddy survey computer assisted telephone interview or would it be an inter internet based survey now let's say if I am trying to determine the uh, level of satisfaction students have with my course in uh, with my my lectures in a class that I teach and let's say there are about a hundred students and let's assume that all of those students have access to the internet 
it would be uh, feasible for me to then uh, design a survey instrument online and then ask the students to log in and anonymously complete that survey. The, it, would be, uh, it would be a good option because A, it's, it's the most effective way of collecting information, but also um, the assumption that my students would have internet access is a, is a rather valid uh, assumption, especially when all students have access to the lab and the labs would have access to the internet. But if you are conducting a survey of uh, uh, households in, in a village somewhere in a remote area of the world, um, then it would be prudent not to design an internet-based survey because uh, the likelihood of uh, readily available internet services in remote parts of the world or even in poor parts of the um, of developed countries or even some developed countries uh, the internet penetration is not as as high as one would assume it to be. Then the question is if it's not an internet-based survey could it be a carry or a telephone-based survey? Well if in the community that you are trying to get information from uh, you know that the telephones are rare, then please avoid telephone-based survey instruments. Um, uh, the best way in that case would be face-to-face -face interviews, but then you would have to hire um, um, surveyors and uh, uh, enumerators, um, and uh, the cost of survey would be slightly higher in that case. The, the decision then comes, the next decision is the define the sampling unit. And the sampling unit is, is uh, are you surveying uh, an individual or are you surveying the household to which that individual belongs to? So you have to define what is the sampling unit. Is it a household? Is it, uh, is it the individual? Are you interviewing the entire employees of a firm or are you only interviewing the general manager of that firm? Right. So the sampling unit has to be clearly identified. And then you have to define a sampling procedure. Is it a random, a quasi-random, a sample of convenience and the like? And also the sample size, are you surveying 400 people or 800 people or 4,000 people? Or in the case of Montreal, where the travel demand survey uh, interviews roughly 100 plus thousand households. And develop the survey management process. So while the survey is being executed, and often large surveys take weeks, if sometimes months to execute, uh, there has to be a sound, prudent, effective, efficient, cost-effective uh, survey management process where the results collected are reviewed regularly, uh, the whole process is being monitored and is, efforts are being made to ensure that no hanky-panky is going on, that the enumerators are in fact going out to the remote areas and collecting information and they are not actually in fact um, filling that information out in the, in the basements or somewhere in the city and then presenting falsified information. And believe you me, this happens a lot. You have to have uh, a very uh, strict management procedure because otherwise uh, the chances are that you, your enumerators would not be that honest uh, to you through the survey. And it's a sad thing to admit to, but this is the reality and they ha it has to be dealt with in, uh, ahead of time. Often people, uh, the, the enumerators or surveyors uh, um, make mistakes because of their ignorance so, uh, and that collected data are, are incorrect, so you need to be uh, aware of these, these things. Once you have the survey instrument designed and everything is ready, you need to pretest the survey. And the pretesting means that you take the survey instrument and you administer it to a small sample, a small number from your sample. And the pretesting allows you to see if there are any inconsistencies or problems with the survey instrument. For instance, if you have asked someone uh, that uh, w did you travel uh, yesterday, did you leave your home for any purpose, and the purpose, uh, and the person replies no then the next question should not be how did you travel? Did you travel by car or truck? Because the person has already informed you that they did not travel yesterday. So there's no need to ask the question about how did you travel. So this, this consistency in your survey is very important and often mistakes like this are, remain even after you have reviewed the surveys a million times and the only way to check these errors is to pretest the survey over a smaller number of your sample and fix the survey before it's administered to the entire sample that you would like to administer it to. Then um, the, the last thing that I would talk about is the, uh, the analysis methods and data storage and management systems. The survey, as I mentioned, that you have to define the objectives of your survey. What are your objectives? Once the objectives have been defi defined, uh, the decisions about how the data would be analyzed and the decision about how the data would be stored are made simultaneously. So you, in advance, have to make decisions 
that I will store this data would be archived in a, in a database, which would be an access database or Oracle database, or it can go directly into um, a statistical anal analysis software such as SPSS, R, or Stata. Now, um, if you are doing an internet-based survey, the, the advantage is that as the respondents complete the survey, the database is, is developed in the background automatically for you. So once the so all respondents have responded, a database is right there for you, and the next process would be to review the data, clean it up. There are lots of errors and inconsistencies. You get rid of those, and then you're left with the clean data, and you proceed with data analysis. So the data storage and management system is a, is a very key consideration. It has to be done in advance. How data would be archived, where it would be stored, in what formats, and how would it be backed up, and where the backups would be located. All this information should be, all these decisions should be made in advance. Now, let us talk briefly about the survey objectives. We need to be very clear about the following. Why are we collecting this information? Why we need this information for? And what, inf why this, what information we need exactly? And how that information would be used? And in, com in terms of transportation, travel behavior surveys, we are asking questions about trips, trip purpose, trip makers. So let's move forward to uh, the definition of trip. And this transportation example would be very helpful because you can actually see, regardless of what your um, area of interest or area of research is, that how detailed one could go with and how detailed one should be involved in, in deciding um, how the data would be collected. And in this case, in transportation, let us start with the definition of trip. What is a trip? A trip is the basic unit of travel. Okay, so a movement from an origin to a destination for a single purpose uh, where the purpose is defined by the activity performed at the destination is called trip. So if you are going to work from your home, then it is a work trip. And if you are going from your home to work but in the, in the process have stopped somewhere at a grocery store or, and then picked up uh, um, a, a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or something else, then that becomes a shopping trip, not a work trip because you traveled from your home uh, to, to a shop and you picked up some, some groceries there, that is a shop uh, uh, retail trip and from there you went to work and that would be your work trip. The trip has to have only one purpose and the purpose, and the purpose of the trip is defined uh, is the, by the activity that you perform at the destination. So what are the trip attributes? So if you know that you, it's a travel behavior data, uh, then you need to define the trip attributes and these are trip start time. When was the trip started? So obviously you need to design a survey in which the question about when you, you started your trip has to be asked. The other th uh, is the trip end time. When did you complete this trip? Uh, what was the purpose? Why did you travel? Where, you, where did you start your trip? Where did you end your trip? And how did you travel? It could very well be that the person used more than one mode. The person may have walked from home to a bus stop and then from uh, bus uh, move to uh, another mode of travel. It could be a paratransit or it could be a metro or a subway or a tram and then um, walked uh, from the destination station to the destination which could be work. So more than one mode was involved that is walking, um, buses and some other modes of travel. So it's a multimodal trip. And then um, the route taken, did you, um, the person could have taken a freeway or a highway or just could have used smaller streets to travel. Um, then the questions about trip length, and the trip length could be measured both in time and in distance. Um, that is, uh, how long it took you to travel, it could be how many kilometers did you travel, or how long in terms of minutes and hours did it take you to complete that trip. And also, the most important thing, how much it cost you to complete that trip, the trip cost. So, from a survey design perspective, if you're designing a travel behavior survey, you need to be mindful of the data or the information you require and the considerations just I have shown you on this slide are some of the considerations against which you have to design the questionnaire and have to have explicit questions in your survey um, to, for, to collect information about these, uh, these attributes. So when you are designing a survey and you ask a question about what is the purpose of your trip, uh, we know that people travel for various purposes, they travel for work, they go to school, uh, when they are at work or school, they travel back to home. So returning home is a trip purpose. Um, people go for shopping and social interaction with families and friends and recreation. 
Um, there's also personal business and there's also work related business and sometimes you're servicing a passenger. Servicing a passenger means that you're dropping your children to a daycare or a school. Uh, so the purpose of the trip is to service, uh, provide a service to other passengers. So knowing these, these um, um, purposes, you design a survey questionnaire in which you ask these alternatives, you present these alternatives to the responder and saying, what was the purpose of your trip? Please select from the following. And was it a work, school, return home, shopping? etc 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 so this is one way of asking questions but when you are at designing this question uh, you should have a complete understanding of what purposes could there be what are the uh, alternatives that would define the that would complete the all possible uh, outcomes for that question I would leave another option here and that is others maybe somebody had another trip purpose that I couldn't think of and then having other would always be good because you can ask them if not the above what are the purpose you have to travel and collect information for that. Now, the travel behavior uh, analysis required not only the information about the trip, but also about the trip maker. Uh, and based on the previous research, we know that uh, um, information about the age of the respondent or the commuter, um, the person's gender, male being fem uh, male or female, uh, full-time employed versus part-time employed, um, a managerial occupation versus uh, um, some other um, um, education levels that is uh, grade 10 or grade 12 or lower or university or, or graduate education um, some proxy for income availability of automobile availability of driver's license and number and types of vehicles owned by the household and the structure of the household you know is it a nuclear family is it a household with just two persons or single person household all these characteristics are important in determining the travel behavior. So we need to collect this information in our survey and therefore questions about age and gender and employment status, all these separate questions have to be asked. And the survey instrument has to be designed in a fashion that the, the, these considerations, these, these, this information is explicitly solicited uh, from your respondents. Now let's briefly talk about the sampling unit. Um, Population is the 100% from which the sample is drawn. Uh, and there are many populations that exist, depending upon the observer, survey objective. The sampling unit is the individual element within the population, uh, which will consider uh, constitute a single observation. And a clear, explicit definition of the population and the sampling unit is very important for the survey design. Now, if you look, look at these, the slide here, um, you will see, and this is the data from uh, Montreal, um, the surveys from 1982 to 2003 are presented. Um, in 1982, the survey consisted 6.9% households in the Montreal city. That was roughly 75,000 households. And it collected information about 492,000 trips. I am using K for kilo or, or, or thousand. So 75K stands for 75,000. Now, in 1987, a smaller sample size of 5% was collected, and it consisted of 54,000 households, and information was collected for 338,000 trips. I'll move to 2003, and in 2003, roughly 4.7% of the households in the study area were surveyed, and that meant 70,000, roughly 70,400 households who were um, asked questions about their travel behavior, and roughly 366,000 trips were recorded in the database. So you could see that these are, these are fairly large surveys, and actually, actually other than the census in, in Canada, uh, these are the, the largest surveys of, uh, of, of, of their kind um, in the world, where 5% households are interviewed and, and information about hundreds of thousands of trips is collected. So let me give you some, some details about the survey in Montreal. It's a telephone-based survey where um, individuals are called uh, on their telephones. Um, and the survey or the sampling design is based on the telephone book. Um, um, the individual telephone numbers are randomly selected, um, but there are certain other considerations in the selection of the sample and those whose telephone numbers come into the sample, uh, they are called, um, and in, before they are called, actually, 
a series of letters are sent to those households from the government informing them about the survey and encouraging them to participate. And of course, the participation in the survey is completely voluntary. Um, the survey in Montreal is designed in 10 languages. The, the language spoken in Montreal is French, um, and the second most common language is English. So obviously, the, the survey is designed both in French and English, English, but there are eight other languages in which the survey questionnaire is designed, and these are in Arabic and Greek and Chinese and Italian, based on the languages spoken in the city, the most common languages. And also, the question about sign language comes into play, that those who, are, um, uh, those who have challenges with, with speech, um, the survey makes an effort to make sure that uh, it reaches out to uh, people with uh, speech impediments or hearing uh, hearing uh, problems. Now, uh, the effort required to design, not only design the survey, but also hire uh, uh, survey uh, enumerators or, or, or data collection individuals, they have to be trained, they have to be proficient in these languages, not only English and French, but also Arabic, Greek, Chinese, and Italian. So you could see that the the job of collecting information from 75,000 households is not that easy. It's a very large survey, and uh, and um, and it, it 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 requires a lot of effort. Now, there's a big, uh, very famous, large marketing market research firm called Leger Marketing. Um, that firm was the one um, that conducted the survey in, uh, uh, and it interviewed about 165,000 individuals uh, from 88 municipalities in the region. The survey began in September 2003, and it ran all the way to December 2003, and um, it was a 15-minute long telephone survey. And the survey asked people the question about how you traveled and uh, how, where did you start your trip and ended your trip, what uh, streets and highways did you travel on, what kind of buses and metros you took, and how long it took you to complete the travel uh, the survey, and also information about their demographics, the age, gender, income, and so on and so forth. The cost of that survey was $1.2 million. Now, this is, again, um, sort of uh, uh, underrepresenting the true cost because the costs involved in terms of hundreds and hundreds of public servants who contributed that, to that survey, their salaries are not, enumerated, uh, are not calculated as part of this cost. This is the explicit cost um, that it was incurred by the agencies by hiring a market research firm to do part of the survey, that is the survey execution, but the design process and all the background support provided by various municipalities and the ministries of transportation. Um, if you include all those costs, this number would go up to as high as 5 to $10 million. Similar to Montreal, we do conduct a survey in Toronto as well, and it's called the Transportation Tomorrow Survey, and it is conducted in the greater Toronto area, that is Toronto and its uh, surrounding suburbs. And the survey is a quenquennial survey, just as the one in Montreal, which is conducted in every five years. And um, in Toronto, the survey is a one-day survey. It qu asks questions about the trips made yesterday, and it collects information about the trips made by all households in the last day. Um, and these are uh, household members who are adults, that is, 11 years and older. Now, um, what is of interest is to pay some attention to, to the this slide here, and it has some very interesting information about survey conduction, and it tells you the details um, that a survey, pro a survey execution goes through. Now, if you consider the information listed in 19, under 1986 TTS, and I will just make a pointer here so that uh, it's highlighted, so here in 1986 TTS, right here, we have uh, roughly 1.47 million uh, households in the in the population. That is the number of households who are living in, in, in the greater Toronto area. Now, the target was to solicit information from 5% of those households. So that information is here. And once the survey was completed, it, re it was uh, realized that the total completed survey constituted 4.2% of the entire uh, population. So the approximate numbers of letters mailed to prospective, prospective uh, respondents was about 102,000 letters, and it turned out that out of those 102,000 letters, the valid contacts, people who were sent letters, and it turned out that the same person was living at that address, that was about 83,000 letters. And the refusal rate was roughly 26%, which means that uh, people declined 
26% of those who received the letter said, well, thank you very much, but we would rather not respond to your survey. And that happens all the time. Please do not take it personal. Uh, it is uh, the respondent's prerogative to either consent or not to consent to your uh, request for a survey. The only exception is the census because there's a con most countries there's a law, the federal law, that, that, uh, that it makes every, res every citizen um, uh, responsible t for responding to the survey. So you are you are mandated. It's you're mandated to respond, and you it's it's an obligation that you have to comply. Now the completion rate for the survey was 60 percent. So for out of those people who received the letter, so 102,000 letters were sent. It turned out that the addresses were wrong in in, in a large number of letters. So the valid contacts were 83,000. Of those, 26 percent refused. And then uh, in total, once you got all the completely filled letters, your response rate turned out to be 60%. So for every 100 letters sent, you've got feedback for 60 individuals or 60 households. The final database that was conducted from, uh, from, the, from this uh, survey uh, included 61,000 households. And it's right here, 61,000 households. And of those households, there were about 171,000 individuals, and those 171,000 individuals reported making about 313,000 trips. And out of those 313,000 trips, there were about 56,000 trips in the survey that were made by public transit. If I were to take you from 1986 all the way to 2001, uh, you would notice that the size of the city increased from 1.47 million households to 2.5 million households. And again, the target was 5%, and the completed sample was 5.5%. And I'll discuss that probably later, how this could happen. But the sample used was 215,000, and the valid contacts were 174,000. Again, 21% refused, and the completion rate was 64%. And if you scroll down later, uh, sorry, if you scroll down further, um, a little further, you'll notice that this time around, the household records were about 136,000. So remember in 1986, our sample had 61,000 households, but by 2001, the size of the households almost, actually more than doubled. The, there were 374,000 personal records. These are the individuals in the database who recorded roughly 817,000 trips. And the total, in total, 85,000 of those trips were um, made by public transit. Okay. So, based on this, if you look at the general uh, trends that came out of the database after the database was established and cleaned and archived, um, on average, there are 2.7 persons per household. That is, each household has pretty much uh, more or less 2.7 persons. Um, and um, the adults made roughly 2.5 trips per, per day per person. And um, in terms of uh, how the survey was conducted, there were 120 survey stations, that is computer uh, stations established in the survey room, and there were about as many um, survey um, staff who was making those calls and recording the, inf the information. Um, in total, interviewers and supervisors uh, there were 275 interviewers and supervisors involved, and there were another 13 staff members who were coding the information. So you could see how big this enterprise becomes when you're doing a very large survey. In total, the, the survey in Toronto cost roughly $2.5 million. And, and again, these surveys are very expensive. Um, in developing countries, my, my rough estimate is that it should cost you about $2 uh, per, per, res per response or per observations. In, in developed countries, it could go as high as $10 uh, per response. You could see in this slide here that the comparison, cost comparison, that from uh, 1986, it cost about $1.5 million and the cost per uh, survey was $24. And by 2001, by effective survey execution and management, the cost per respondent went down to $15. And this is an, a clear-cut example of uh, a survey management team
that is focused on improving the standard but also making the survey more cost effective. So even though the total cost moved up from 1.5 million to 2.1 million dollars, uh, in, in effect the cost per interview or the cost per observation went down from 24 dollars or 25 dollars in 1986 to in fact 15.5 dollars in 2001. And these are the things that one has to look into when you're reviewing survey techniques, when you're reviewing survey methods, that how others are uh, using pr uh, prudent methods and management techniques to bring down the survey costs year by year. Now a, a few words about the, the sampling procedures. Um, simple random is the most commonly discussed, but there's also stratified random and the cluster sampling. Now, I would like to draw your attention to this slide here. Now, in sim simple random uh, technique, each sampling unit, that is each individual, if you're looking at individuals, uh, persons, and each household, if a survey is based on household, they have an each, sam each of those sampling units within the population has equal probability of being selected. So if you are doing a survey uh, in, a, in a group of 400 people, and you're uh, collecting information on a 10% sample, so that is you're going to pick up 40 individuals, um, each of those 400 individuals will have, should have the same probability of being selected for the, in that sample. That would be a random sample. Now, it is ideal in the sense that population totals can easily be computed from sample values. You do not have to assign a weight to every observation in corresponding. To, uh, if it's a, not a random sample, then um, sampling weights are um, instituted and that's a rather advanced topic for this course how do you come up with sampling weights and we probably would discuss it later in the in the course uh, but um, if it's a if it's a random sample that there's no need to, to compute uh, um, uh, assigned weights and you can easily quickly compute population characteristics and the simple random samples uh, are not efficient sometimes or not feasible now the stratified random sample is another example what you do is you divide the population into subgroups and sample subgroups at different rates. Now, um, in, in cases where you see that there is an uh, obvious uh, uh, discrepancy in, your, in, in the population, that, uh, in the sample that you would draw, for instance, um, let's say there's a classroom in which you would like to do a survey, and in your classroom you have about 100 students, and out of those 100 students, 20 are females and 80 are male. But you know that in your society, in the city at large, or in the country, um, um, the population distribution is 50-50, 50% males, 50% females. And if you are trying to find, make inference about the population outside of your classroom based on a survey that you will execute in your classroom, and you have 20% females and 80% males, a random sample would not give you the right uh, mix because uh, the 20% females would, in a random sample would give, um, uh, return a sample uh, proportionate to their size in the classroom. So th in this case we do stratified random sampling. Now look at this example here. Um, we have two groups. We have a subgroup 1 and a subgroup 2. And in the subgroup 1 we have a population size of 3,000. Right. In the subgroup 2 we have a population size of 7,000. And uh, if we were to take a sample rate of 10 percent we'll get 300 observations here, and the relative size of this would be 0.3. And if you were to take a random, if we do a 5% sample of this, we'll get 350, and the relative size is 0.7. Now, with simple random sample, if you were to get 300 observations from 3,000, uh, uh, from subgroup 1, we would need at least 1,000 observations. If we were to draw a random sample, from a total population of 10,000, 3,000 of subgroup 1 and 7,000 of subgroup 2, 7,000 plus 3,000, 10,000. In order to get 300 observations in our sample, we would have to get um, a sample size of 10%, which would then be 10% uh, of 10,000 would be 1,000. However, we have uh, conducted a stratified random sample where from uh, subgroup 1, we uh, conducted a survey so that we collected a sample size of 10 percent, so 300 comes out of 3,000. And in the other larger group, subgroup 2, we uh, sampled at a rate of 5 percent and uh, got 350 observations. And we are able to get 300 observations, if that was a target, to get it from sub subgroup 1 by using a sample of 750 or 650, 300 plus 350. 
but in the case of um, a purely random sample, we would have uh, had to survey about a thousand um, individuals. The cluster sampling is another widely used technique, and what we do is we divide the population into clusters and then randomly select um, uh, a set of clusters, and then from those clusters we draw random samples. And uh, the, the, the sampling units from within clusters could either be uh, selected based on a 100-person uh, sample, or we can actually draw, uh, conduct random samples from randomly selected uh, clusters. An example um, of uh, random samples could be um, um, the household travel service. For instance, the cluster could be the household, um, and the sampling uni unit is the individual. Now, one can uh, randomly select uh, households, and then from those households, one can uh, survey the entire household or randomly select members from the household. And that is, the, 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 if you are trying to get a survey of individuals, um, um, you can do a random sample of the individuals, but a prudent way to do it is to uh, cluster individuals into households and then randomly select households, and from those households, do a survey of individuals, either by randomly selecting them within clusters or doing a 100% sample within the cluster. And if for in, in terms of employment service, uh, the cluster could, clusters could be buildings. Uh, you randomly select buildings, and from buildings, you randomly select the firms within the building, or you select all firms within the building. And if once you have selected the firms, you can either survey um, randomly selected employees from within those firms, or you can survey the entire set of employees within the firms that have been selected within the buildings that were selected in the first. So clusters could be hi hierarchical. You have a building as a cluster, and then the firm within the building, and then the re employee within the firm. So the sample size calculations uh, follow next, and uh, we will start take a break here and pick up uh, the discussion about sample sizes in our next lecture, in which we'll first discuss sample sizes, and then we'll do an empirical example followed by the uh, discussion on databases and how databases are managed and designed. And um, um, this concludes our lecture on uh, surveys and samplings. The part one of the lecture is now being concluded. Thank you.